All right. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Sarah for funding this. This is actually our, we got two years in a row of funding for this. So this is our, this is our second year of, of receiving this and um, we really appreciate it. And it's a little bit different than a, than a traditional partnership grant. Um, so you'll, you'll see, you'll see why as, as we go through. Um, but what we did uh, in applying for the SARE grant is basically said to SARE, this is a model other people can use to um, partner with and share resources with indigenous communities. Um, and and let's, let's get going. Um, but first, I want to give you a little bit of context. Um, if people don't know who Seed Savers Exchange is and what we are, uh, we are actually a nonprofit organization started in 1975, um, and our mission is to steward America's culturally diverse and endangered garden and food crop legacy for present and future generations. We educate, connect people through collecting, regenerating, sharing heirloom seeds, plants, and stories. Uh, these are just some of the, the pictures of what we have uh, up in Northeast Iowa and Decorah, Iowa, which is where we're, we're located. Um, the first picture is our visitor center with our evaluation garden. You have a shot of the, the, the seed collection, uh, the, quote, the vault, um, and some of the, the fields and, and gardens that we have uh, around the, um, the property, which is almost 900 acres. <clears throat> but the way Seed Savers Exchange was actually through family tradition. So Diane Ott Wheelie, um, who was one of our co-founders, along with her husband at the time, Kent Wheelie, they were new, newlyweds, and Diane received some heirloom varieties from her, her grandfather, and she had no idea that those varieties were brought over by her relatives and ancestors from Bavaria back in the 1800s. One of them was this morning glory that you see around Grandpa Ott, and the other one um, right here, and this other one is this German pink tomato. Um, you can actually find those all over the country, and multiple different organizations offer those now. And so as Diane uh, and Kent realized that these are family heirlooms, they wondered if other people out there had uh, family heirlooms that they wanted to share. And so in 1975, they put out a letter to Mother Earth News Magazine, which maybe a lot of you know about. And Kent wrote that he uh, they had a plan to form the True Seed Exchange. And in that very first year, uh, about 29 people joined, and it just expanded from there. Uh, we still facilitate that ex seed exchange program. Uh, we have uh, this year uh, for 2022 about 450 people uh, that uh, have participated and list seeds to share amongst others. Um, <clears throat> so this is a little bit of, of a background on the exchange and, and the yearbook. So in 1975, 29 listers, 70. The height of it was in the mid-90s where we had about 1,000 people listing in this uh, print publication called the yearbook. Um, but in 2022, we had about uh, 430. And in that book and in those listings, over almost 22,000 varieties and about 15,000 of those are unique that you cannot find anywhere else. Um, so these are people's family heirloom varieties, varieties that have been around for, for a while and they uh, just want other people to grow and share. And so this is called participatory con conservation. So uh, we believe that seeds are safer um, being grown by many people and not just centrally located. Um, they are able to adapt to local climates. Uh, people offer their own seeds to other gardeners around the country. Uh, this is just a map of some of the people that participate in our community science program. Um, so it's people from all over the country. But we have connections to indigenous seeds. Um, in the 80s, as this um, network expanded, um, indigenous people started to list seeds and, and develop relationships. One of them is, is a Mohawk elder named Steve Silver Bear McCumber. He just sent me this picture a couple of weeks ago with this amazing Tuscarora white corn that he's holding there. And he actually, um, this book uh, was developed by a man by the name of Doug Eglund. And he and Steve actually started to collect Iroquois bean varieties. And Steve and Doug started to list them um, on the Seed Savers Exchange um, yearbook. And so you could start finding indigenous varieties in that yearbook 
um, going back into the 80s. Um, this other man by the name of uh, Carl White Eagle Barnes, um, um, he passed away in 2016, but he was a seed keeper of Cherokee uh, origin. And he started listing um, in the 90s uh, varieties um, that he was looking for and, and keeping. Um, but we also have other, other organizations that have listed um, indigenous seeds, so Native Seed Search. Uh, which was started in um, the, the mid 80s. Um, and then people started to get indigenous uh, seeds out of the USDA, list them in the yearbook, donate them to Seed Savers Exchange. And then this other real interesting uh, organization from Maine called Dharma Farm, um, the, the people that started that uh, have, have um, indigenous origin as well. And they started to uh, look for indigenous varieties and donate them to Seed Savers Exchange as well. So. As time went on, um, uh, Rowan White came to um, a, a Mohawk seed keeper, uh, chair of our board, started um, as uh, on the board in 2014. And she recognized that there were a lot of indigenous varieties in the collection here that needed to be uh, with indigenous people that did not have them anymore. Uh, and so she approached me in 2017, and uh, Rowan actually um, started the Indigenous Seakeepers Network. And she said, uh, asked me if, I, if we wanted to participate and form a uh, collaboration with the Indigenous Seakeepers Network. So uh, they came here in, in 2018, and we talked about it and um, kind of threw around some ideas on, on what we could do. And... For the first couple of years, uh, Rowan helped us select varieties to grow on the farm here, and then we would give them to Rowan, and she would take them to um, the communities that were looking for those particular seeds. Uh, that was highlighted by this amazing Taos Pueblo squash rematriation ceremony in New Mexico. Um, this uh, squash was grown here in 2018, and we sent uh, a, a lot of seeds to the, the Taos Pueblo people uh, for a large um, rematriation ceremony. Um, but what does seed rematriation um, refer to and what does it actually mean? It's the returning of seeds to the community of origin, specifically indigenous communities. Many people hear of the word repatriation. Indigenous people use the word rematriation because historically speaking, the women were the seed keepers. So everybody farmed, but it was the the uh, tradition and the job of the women to keep the seeds. So when you are rematriation, when you're sending seeds back to communities of origin, you typically are sending them back to the women who are going to be the seed keepers of those communities. So that's why they are starting to use uh, rematriation. <clears throat> so then we started to, to talk a little bit more about how we can expand uh, the rematriation project. Um, how can we partner with Indigenous Seed Keepers Network? And how can we send seeds to partners to grow and share? So the idea is to not have Seed Savers Exchange exclusively growing these varieties on our farm here to rematriate, but to send seeds back to the community so they can grow them themselves, save seeds and share them. And so we, uh, we submitted a grant in 2020 to uh, SARE, the uh, North Central SARE region. And um, we, with Rowan's guidance, um, we connected with Shelly Buffalo, uh, the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Coordinator, uh, Dr. Rebecca Webster of the United Nation, and Jessica Greendeer, who is a Ho-Chunk seed keeper um, with Dream of Wild Health. Uh, and we were funded. Um, it was amazing. Uh, and we were so stoked to, to have this, this happen. And then... At the end of 2021, we thought, well, maybe we should try again, because one of the critiques of that first grant was that we didn't have enough farmers. And so uh, Jessica Greendeer actually recommended a couple more people to participate in, in this year's cycle for rematriation, Shiloh Maples, who is now the program manager at Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, Rosebud Bear Schneider, who is the farm manager at ZB Mung. Wong uh, Farm up in Northern Michigan, uh, Eartha Bohr Bell, who is an environmental justice consultant in the Twin Cities, uh, Sue Menzel, who is farm manager at Lakota Ray Ojibwe College in Northern Wisconsin, and then um, Kelly Zahn is the agricultural agent at Stockbridge Mun Muncie Community in Wisconsin. Shelly Buffalo 
um, had moved on. And so um, new people came into the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty, Christina Black Cloud, Luke Kapayu, and Avis Bear Bass. And so we expanded from three to eight. Um, so that's that was really great just for Jessica to recommend other people to participate in this this um, this grant. The other amazing thing, um, big shout out to Sarah, is that the bulk of the grant actually went to the farmers themselves. So Seed Savers Exchange the first year, we got a little bit more of the cut, but this year we did not at all. The bulk of that money went to the farmers to support growing those varieties on their farm to share them and find people to, to be seed keepers of these particular varieties. Um, the, oh, the other um, great thing is that Jessica Green Deer, even though she is with Dream of Wild Health, uh, she has her own farm um, in Hudson, Wisconsin called Little Skies Farm. And so she was growing uh, at her farm in Wisconsin as well. Um, <clears throat> so what, what are some of the, the, the partnership project goals? Well, each partner chooses and grows varieties that they want to rematriate and share with their community or family. Um, we don't dictate that whatsoever. It's solely based off of them. Uh, we have a large spreadsheet of potentially indigenous varieties uh, that we have shared with them, and they just pick and choose what they, they want to grow. Um, we continue to grow on site here um, to support what, what the farmers are doing. And then the big thing is it's an exchange of ideas and an exchange of cultural awareness about how uh, indigenous cultures and communities respect these seeds and how they grow them. And it really informs us uh, how to do that on the farm here as well. Um, and then also, a, um, for example, Kelly Zahn at Stockbridge Muncie, she didn't have a lot of seed, ex uh, seed saving experience. And so we shared a lot of um, educational materials that we already had at Seed Savers Exchange with um, some of the more novice seed savers in the group. And at the same time, people like Jessica and Becky uh, and Luke down at the Meskwaki, who have been seed saving for a really, really long time, it was a platform and it was a way to connect people together to, to not just share what we do at Seed Savers Exchange, but what other, um, more of these indigenous farmers do. Um, So these are some of the um, numbers that we, we've grown um, these past couple of years. So in 2020, 2021, it was 28 varieties. And as you can see in 2020, 2022, there was a lot more varieties. We actually grew about 20 varieties ourselves here. And then on top of that, it was about 40 other varieties. So um, it was about 60 varieties for rematriation to this past year alone. Um, this picture that you see here um, was Becky's harvest from 2020. And you can see how incredible her harvest was. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what Becky Becky does. Um, so what are some of the challenges, some of the highlights that that we've we've experienced over these these past couple of years? We um I'm sure most of you had to kind of pivot from what you were hoping for and what you were hoping to plan uh, for 2020. We had built in a lot of um, field days and on-site field visits in 2020 so we could go to the um, Meskwaki Nation, so we could go over to Becky in Wisconsin. We could go up to the um, Dream of Wild Health in the Twin Cities. Unfortunately, COVID hit and we we're kind of stuck like wondering what to do. We continued to meet once a month via via Zoom. Um, but I was inspired by um, a video that I saw a couple of years ago um, from the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network about seed rematriation. Um, it was about a five minute long video. And I thought, let's just make a video of featuring Becky and Shelly and Jessica. And so if you, if you go to our website, I won't play the whole video because it's seven and a half minutes long. Um, but if you go to our YouTube page, you could click on it right from our Seed Savers Exchange website. Here is the um, the video. Check it out. It's really incredible. Um, it's it's a it's quite beautiful. Um, we hired a um, a videographer that Shelley and the Meskwaki Nation uh, had worked with for, for quite a while. And he did some really great, great uh, shots and videos and, and interviews. So check it out. It's, it's really quite amazing. 
as you know, um, some of you may remember if you're from Iowa or, or bordering states in August 2020, we had a horrible derecho just run right through the, the center part of the state and it totally impacted the Meskwaki Nation. Um, this is a, 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 a picture taken by the Des Moines Register. Um, some of the corn that Shelley was growing that year, it was completely knocked down. And so they had complete losses of, of corn. Um, but Shelley went out there and basically harvested every single uh, year off of those um, so that they could do a, uh, a boil. Um, that's one of their traditional methods of, of growing corn and eating. It's a green corn boil. So she went out there with a bunch of other people and they harvested every single year because they did not want to let that go to waste. Um, so that was a big challenge. Um, one of the great things is that they grew this uh, really old um, watermelon called Illinois that came from the Cahokia site um, just over the uh, Illinois border and um, from Missouri. And um, I said it was one of the best watermelons they've ever grown and they saved seed and they, they saved enough seed to share with other people and also grow this year as well. Uh, so that's, that's amazing. Um, Jessica Green Deer, being Ho Chunk, she's on the lookout for um, Ho Chunk corn varieties that she has not um, grown yet. And so we were able to reunite her with several Ho Chunk corn, including uh, this one called Winnebago Spotted. Um, Winnebago is um, the name that the French gave to the Ho Chunk people. So Ho Chunk and Winnebago, it's, it's the, the same. Um, she had been looking for this this variety for for quite some time, so um, we were super thrilled about that. Um, unfortunately, one of the 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 Chippewa Bear Island corn, the deer, absolutely, she said they that was the only corn that year that the deer ate. They didn't, they left all the other corn um, alone except for that particular one. Um, so that was a little bit of a, a bummer for her. Um, and then. Um, really cool thing that Becky Webster did is she started a bean growers co-op with 10 Oneida families. So she was centrally, um, she was like the central farm where she was growing these varieties and then sharing with these 10 families to grow themselves. Um, one amazing thing that, so Becky has 10 acres um, just outside um, uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is where Oneida Nation um, is. And um, they bought this land several years ago, and they are slowly building up the soil and restoring it to really rich farmland. And one thing that Becky does is um, she grows uh, Three Sisters Gardens in these mound systems. So the H H traditional um, Haudenosaunee Confederacy uh, Three Sisters Gardens are in these big mound systems. And these mounds are several feet tall. And um, you can see the picture here. She has two gardens and she had like 200 some mounts. Um, and this is how uh, she still grows today. And she's, she did a little bit of comparison and it was really interesting to hear uh, how the corn and the, the plants grew in the mound system compared to like the traditional row system. And I wanna, I wanna go back to this picture of all these corn that were blown down by the derecho because Shelley said that these, these corn varieties were all grown in a traditional row system. Some of the other Meskwaki people were growing um, on the mounded systems and uh, they, they noted that after the, uh, the derecho went through and knocked over the corn, the corn in the mound systems actually started to, to grow back up. Uh, a lot better than the the row crop varieties. Um, so these mound systems, there's a lot of knowledge, traditional indigenous knowledge about how to grow these varieties uh, in a mound system. Um, and I just I just love this this drone shot picture of these mounded gardens. So you can see the contour and, and how they're laid out. And they take tractors out there and they build up the soil, uh, which is really amazing. Um, the other really cool thing is is um, sometimes we at Seed Savers Exchange, we don't know what a name of a particular variety is. Um, this bean uh, had the PI number and the PI refers to the number that the USDA gave to that particular variety. And when 
Becky saw the scan of it, she said, well, that's Seneca bird egg bean that I grew last year. And so she sent me a picture and sure enough, identical. And so now we know that this bean is actually Seneca bird egg bean instead of this PI276298. So that's the exchange of knowledge that, that we're looking for as well uh, along the way. Um, <clears throat> what were some of the challenges and highlights this year? Um, Sue Menzel, the farm manager at La Couture, ended up retiring midsummer. Um, she said it was so dry uh, at the beginning of the growing season that she could not plant a thing. Um, and so she retired. Um, she still has all of her seeds. She has not been able to grow them. And um, she's looking forward to, to moving back to Chicago, uh, where she, where she um, grew up and, and um, doing some work with um, uh, indigenous communities down there and doing rematriation work there. Um, the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty uh, people came to visit here in, in August, which was amazing. Um, Becky Webster has officially a nonprofit. Uh, here is her website, um, Ukwakwa. Uh, she also has a great YouTube channel about everything she does. So if you go to that website and, and click on the YouTube channel, she has tons of videos to, to watch about how they grow traditionally, how they cook their food. Um, it's really quite amazing. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Jessica Green Deer grew at her home farm. Um, one cool thing that Rosebud and Shiloh did is that because they are both in Michigan, that they wanted to grow, and Shiloh is in, in southern Michigan, Rosebud is way up north, they wanted to grow several of the same varieties to do comparisons. Um, we're still working on that, that'll be in our final report for this year, um, but that was a really great thing just to see how climate, even in the same state, affects how these varieties grow. Um, Kelly Zahn uh, mentioned that um, their traditional stock bridge um, bean, which you see here, they did not have a couple years ago, and now they have enough that they are never going to be able to never lose that variety again. Um, and I chatted with Eartha Borbell, and she said she's taking all of her varieties with her when she visits her family down in, in Oklahoma uh, this summer. If you go to the video and watch the video, it's some quotes. Um, Jessica uh, says that for, for, for them, you can't have food sovereignty without seed sovereignty. So they need the seeds back to, to where they belong. Um, and she specifically said it's, it's the seeds of their ancestors. That's where they came from. And so this is welcoming someone home that you haven't met before. And you just can't describe that. Um, Becky put it right out there and said, you know, we had been assimilated. We lost a lot of our varieties through forced relocation. Um, and now we're reconnecting to our foods. We're making that available to our community, which he's doing through our co-op. Um, and they're doing that out in the open. And it's a way to reclaim who they are. And this quote from Shelly, with seeds, there is no language barrier. When you grow them out and complete the cycle of keeping the new seeds, you're connected through the process to your grandmothers going back thousands of years. So what are some of the takeaways that me, I personally have learned through these two years of, of working um, with Indigenous Sea Keepers Network? It's just really rewarding to engage with others in meaningful work. Um, and it's not just, you know, a lot of people know Seed Savers Exchange as a seed company and people buy seeds from us, but there's so much more we do um, than, than just that. Um, and engaging others to find seeds that they want to welcome home is just incredible. Um, talking to Shelly this week, she said that, you know, one of the things that happened for her in that first year um, on the grant, because COVID hit, a lot of people lost their support systems. And she said with Becky and Jessica, it created this new support system for her. Um, and Shelly got to travel with Kale to shoot these videos and she felt refreshed and she came to Seed Savers Exchange this past year to, to work in our gardens as a seasonal seed steward uh, to check us out a little bit more. Um, so that was really great. Um, 
And then a lot of people always wonder like, well, if I want to do this work and if I want to partner, like what, what do we do? And I give Sarah a lot of props for saying, if you want these grants, you need to support the farmers that you are working with and we will do that. Um, so financial support information for this, for this purpose, it was like seed saving information. Um, you know, if you can do field visits now, I think that's really important. We're talking about that for next year, how we can get more people here, how we can get more people to the field sites where everybody is. And it also gives a platform for voicing concerns, desires, how they see uh, protocols and procedures here at Seed Savers Exchange. Uh, we have a frequent check-in uh, once a month with everybody, uh, sharing of information and decide how to move forward together. Um, the other thing I want to plug, it's not ready yet, but um, because we didn't have on the on the farm uh, field visits, we're doing some webinars coming up. And the first one is actually going to be on the 18th. Uh, we have not um, uh, advertised for them yet because we're just getting that together and it should be out next week. Um, but we're going to have four webinars, two in January and two in uh, late February and into March featuring the partners. So. Um, we will uh, forward that over to Sarah and they can help promote as well. Um, so that's kind of our, our field days um, featuring the partners on, on these webinars. So um, with that, I think that is my last slide.